Hi everyone, we've got another jam-packed video for you today as we build ahead to tomorrow's Conference League clash against Bodo Glimt. Can you tell I'm excited about this new competition? There's not even in that. All joking aside, and I realise that was a bit like Frank Lampard, what I just did there, I am very excited about this new Conference League. I'm also on a bit of a high today because I have just come off a press conference call with both Ange Postacoglu and Georgios Yakamakis. We'll bring you what they both had to say later in this video. I'm also going to focus in on Bodo Glimt, or Glimt, as I think I should now call them. I'm going to tell you all about them, the kind of state they're in going into tomorrow night's first leg. We'll do a predicted 11 as well. But we're going to start with the aforementioned UEFA Europa Conference League what is this beautiful competition? Well, the origins of this wonderful competition actually go back all the way to 2015, but it wasn't until December 2018 when UEFA formally announced it. That was for their cycle from 2021 to 2024. I think we've spoken about cycles a little bit in the past. At first, it was labelled the Europa League 2. Yeah, they're very inventive at UEFA. The official name, the UEFA Europa Conference League, was announced the following September. The competition was to give more clubs from more associations a chance to compete in Europe. That's basically what it does and what it has done in its first season. It's a tournament for teams out with the major leagues and countries in Europe. If you look at the teams that make up the last 16 of the Champions League this season, for example, you will notice that basically all of them come from major European nations. I think Salzburg are maybe the only real exception this year, but you're mainly looking at Germany, Spain, Italy, France... England, of course, as well. I don't know how I forgot them there. The Conference League knockouts, meanwhile, have sides from Azerbaijan, Israel, Greece, Denmark, Norway, Serbia, and more. So it's certainly doing its job. Celtic drop into the competition at what UEFA are calling the preliminary knockout round. So we'll face Bodo Glimt, and if we get past them, we'll be through to the round of 16. So if we want to win the competition, we'll have to beat five teams consecutively to lift the trophy. Speaking of which, the first final of the Conference League is in Tirana, Albania at the Arena Combatari. And we know that Celtic have some links to Albania currently. The president's a big Celtic fan, so I hear. No idea why I was whispering there. But the competition has had many detractors, including Scott McDonald, who only just last week broke my heart by telling me that he basically didn't care at all about the Conference League. Brendan Rodgers also famously admitted that he didn't know much about the competition, but his Leicester side are one of the many big names that Celtic may have to get past if we want to win the competition. There are some very tasty teams in this tournament, don't be fooled by that at all. For example, Jose Mourinho's AS Roma, the Eredivisie's second best side PSV Eindhoven, Ligue 1's second place side Marseille, Fenerbahce, Top of the Czech League, Slavia Prague, the aforementioned Leicester City, Wren, Basel, need I go on? So despite what some people are saying, I think this can still be a very glamorous competition for Celtic with some big names, but also a tournament that gives us a realistic opportunity to win some matches and maybe win a few ties. We've not won a post-Christmas knockout tie since 2004, so it's about time that we start doing that. And I think we've got an opportunity to go on a little bit of a run in this competition while still playing against, you know, decent, decent sides. Now, I never really mentioned Bookies odds on the channel because Bookies don't really need the advertising at all. But I'm told that Celtic are seventh favourites for this competition. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of the opportunity that we have in this tournament. But obviously the players and Ange will only be focusing on Bodo Glimt for now and that's what we should do as well. It's, it's hard to know exactly what to expect from the Norwegian champions given that they've lost so many players since the draw was made. We spoke to David Weatherston when the draw was made and he told us that Bodo Glimt were going to lose a number of players. They could possibly lose their manager, Kato Knutson, as well. And 
The manager part didn't play out, but certainly the losing several key players has. In that time since the draw forward, Eric Bottheim has departed for Krasnodar for £4.5 million. Starman Patrick Berg went to Longs in France for £4 million. Frederick Bjorkan left on a free to Hertha Berlin. Marius Loda went to Schalke on a free transfer. And you may have heard that Elias Melkerson left to Hibs for 300000 although he'd never made a breakthrough at Glimt. Ola Solbakken is still there, though, and he was a pretty key player for Glimt in the group stage of this competition. And he's actually, his name was brought up by a Norwegian journalist in the press conference earlier with Anne. So he seems like the guy that we're going to have to keep an eye on. And crucially for Bodo Glimt, their legendary manager, Ketel Nutsen, is still at the club. He's led them to the last two Norwegian league titles. That's the first in their history. So amazing, unprecedented times for this club. And they're one of the favourites for the new elite see. And they're one of the favourites for the new elite Syrian season, which doesn't begin until April. And given that Glimt haven't actually played a game since mid-December, I think there's an opportunity for Celtic in this tie, and especially the first leg to catch them cold. Certainly be catching cold in the return leg because it's right next to the Arctic Circle. Put simply, this is a tie that I would expect Celtic to win in most seasons, Never mind when we're playing so well at the moment. And I think there's a real good opportunity for us tomorrow night to get a good lead in the tie. But I think Bodo Glimt are a very dangerous side. We certainly shouldn't underestimate them at all. It's a really tough place to visit. As I say, the town of Bodo is just north of the Arctic Circle. It's on an artificial surface at the Asp Myra Stadion. Roma got trounced 6-1 there earlier this season. So that's enough warning to Ange and the players and all the fans as well about how dangerous the return leg could be and to be honest how dangerous tomorrow night could be as well. For as good as Bodo Glimt were at home in the group stage, they won every game in the Conference League group stage, they drew all three away from the home as well so they weren't beaten at all in six matches which is pretty decent but I think tomorrow night's match is going to be the making of the tie. If we can go to Norway with a couple of goal head start, we'll be in a really good place. If we fail to win tomorrow night, it could be a pretty tough second leg. Now, let's get on to the main event. Now, first of all, Ange gave a bit of an injury update. He says Mikey Johnson has sprained his ankle. It's nothing too serious, but it will keep the winger out for, quote, a little while. Josip Juranovic, sorry, let me redo that. Josip Juranovic is back for tomorrow night. He's missed the last few games. While uh, Yoski Ideguchi, or just Gucci, is not eligible. He's not registered for this competition. We covered that a couple of weeks ago. Celtic could only add three new players to the squad for the knockout rounds of this competition and we chose O'Reilly, Hatate and Maida. So poor old Gucci missed out. Now, I was also on today's press conference and got to ask Ange a couple of questions. This is how it went down. Sorry, I should say, by the way, that we are only allowed to bring you the audio from this clip. Celtic don't actually send us the video at all for some reason. So here we go. Hi Ange, um, last week we spoke to your former captain at Brisbane Roar, Matt Smith, uh, he described... Matty playing... Smith, how's Matty Smith? Is he... He's a good he's, guy, he's a, he's yeah, a hell of a nice guy. He's a good guy, guy. he's yeah, too he... nice to be a centre-back, let me tell you, but he's yeah. a nice guy. He, he described playing out from the back under you as being, quote, petrifying until it became normal. You've obviously spoken a fair bit, I think, about not liking the feeling of being comfortable and your players not really want them to feel comfortable. Are there benefits to you in putting players out of their comfort zone and the players improve more as a result? I think it's the only way you improve. I mean, I'm constantly on at the players about that, that, you know, sometimes, you know, people will say, well, that was a perfect training session. No one made a mistake. That kind of sends a signal to me that maybe the training session wasn't tra challenging enough, you know, um, you know, I'm constantly talking about players not being in their comfort zones because comfort means you're doing something not automatically, but something that is not really testing you, you know, and, and 
that's why I'm constantly talking about improvement of us as a team. When people say, well, you know, how much improvement is there in the team? So, well, there's always improvement because once I see that players have got to a level where they can do something um, or excel in something, then my job is to, to test them again and make them uncomfortable. And, you know, when you're uncomfortable and you make mistakes, it probably means if you persevere and, you know, hopefully we provide an environment where we give them the tools to eradicate those mistakes, then you improve. But there's no, there's no point in, in, in me saying, well, you know, we've been really good at playing out from the back. So I don't have to worry about that anymore. No, well, there's, there's other layers to it. And, you know, for us, you saw that on the weekend is, yeah, we had possession, we had comfortable possession, but it wasn't the possession we want to possession we want we want to have as a team. You know, we we, we want to. So that means for players, I'm almost forcing them into making mistakes. And the reality, no one likes making mistakes because when you make a mistake, then there's repercussions. And what I'm trying to show them is that, you know, provided they're trying to do the right things, there won't be any repercussions for me anyway. Um, but that's how I think you get improvement. Uh, and just secondly, I think it's pretty well known that you like to keep your distance a little bit from the players. You don't go in the dressing room too much uh, before matches. What are the benefits of that approach for Celtic? Is it to create um, leadership naturally? Is it more discipline? It's just me, mate. You know, it's it's just, uh, I've always said that you've just got to be yourself. And, and you know, I... Even when I talk to to young coaches, young managers, don't try and copy anyone else. Don't try and do what I do. This is just a natural fit for me. And and I think the dressing room is just my belief. That's the player's domain. It's the player's area. They should be in charge. They should feel comfortable in there. They shouldn't have a, you know, 55 or 56-year-old cranky guy walking around telling them that they, you know, should pick their rubbish up or change the music on their that they're playing. So it's it's about giving them their space. They're preparing for a game. I don't want to get in the way. I've done my bit during the week. My role then on game days to do other things and even during the week. So that, that's just me. And and like I said, it, it suits my personality. I've said before that most important thing I do uh, on a daily basis is make decisions. Um, if we're going to be successful, I'm going to get more decisions right than wrong. The best way to do that is to to get as much information as possible, but to also remain as objective as you possibly can. And every player in there and every staff member knows that I treat them equally with the same respect, have the same care and love for them all. Um, there are no favourites. Um, so they understand that. And uh, that allows me then to to make decisions that I think are best for the football club and, and, and best for us moving forward. Great. I'll tell Smithy you're asking after them. Thanks, man. So there we go. Great stuff once again from Ange giving me and the other Celtic fan media real in-depth answers to our questions. It's it's massively appreciated. And once again, just great to have him at the club and great to have a manager who you look forward to hearing from. You know, we've had managers in the past where you've been tearing your hair out listening to them. Um, and, and Ange certainly isn't like that. You just wish you could listen to the guy speak every day of your life because um, he always seems to say the right things. Now... The player that was up today in press was Georgios Yakamakis. He was asked about the lure of European football in signing for Celtic. And he gave what I thought was a really good answer. So have a wee listen. How big an influence was coming to Celtic? How, how big an influence were, were European nights like these for the decision for you to come to, to Celtic? I didn't, I, it, I didn't choose Celtic. Chose Celtic because of the game, of the European games only. It's uh, something extra. You chose uh, Celtic because it's Celtic. It's uh, an amazing club. It's a big club uh, with uh, big targets every year. Uh, but of course, the European games is uh, something really special for us, for the players, and it's something that uh, played his part. Hi, Gorgias. Um, I, I think I'm right in saying the the four goals you've scored have all been one touch finishes. Is that something that, that you feel really natural doing as opposed to taking touches? Yeah, it's something really natural, something uh it's one of my of my abilities. Uh I love to, to score with one touch. And it's something that um I always use in the training also. And I uh, need to improve even more. Um because uh I will have my chances in this in this team, uh, so I need to to be focused. I need to be sharp, 
uh, because it, this situation will come in every game. And also just on the manager, um, there's obviously that Greek connection between you and, and Ange Postacoglu. How helpful has he been to you since coming to the club? Uh, he's been really helpful, not because he's Greek, uh, because he's, uh, he's a very good person. First of all, this is the most important for me and a uh, very good coach. Uh, one of the best I've ever worked. And I'm really happy for being here. He's another one that just gets it. And judging from my Twitter feed when I tweeted out that response and it went nuts, Celtic fans are absolutely loving this guy. You know, a lot of the replies I got from people were, I've never wanted a guy to succeed more at Celtic. He just gets it. He He's part of this whole team that just gets it. And I thought he came across really well, you know, speaking in uh, a language that isn't his most natural one. Let's go to predicted 11 time and we're going for Joe Hart in goals with Josip Juranovic at right back, Cameron Carter, Vickers and Carol Starfield reunited in the middle and Greg Taylor back at left back. Callum McGregor back in holding midfield with Matt O'Reilly and Rio Hatati in front, Liel Abada on the right, Jota on the left and Georgios Yakamakis through the middle. I think that is what Ange will go for. I certainly think he'll start Yakimakis. Midfield, you could easily see Tom Rogic in instead of Matt O'Reilly. I've just got a wee funny feeling that he might keep Rogic for Sunday and play Matt O'Reilly tomorrow night, given that he had the weekend off. I think it will be a tough game for us tomorrow night. I hope the atmosphere is rocking and I hope that the support in general are patient with the team because if we're... Fancy and rolling up and beating them by 3, 4, 5 nil. I just don't think that's going to happen. I think it's going to be much tighter than that. Um, but having said that, I think they'll come out and play as well. So it should give us space in behind um, to you know exploit with our pace. So very excited for it. We will have the reaction for you tomorrow night. I'll be outside the ground. I think it's going to be John on with me. Um, but you need to tune in tomorrow night to see for sure. And hopefully we're looking back on another positive night for Celtic. Don't forget to give us a sub on the channel if you've just come across us in the last few days. It really does help to build the channel if you can sub and also click the like button. Thanks all you wonderful legends. We hope you've enjoyed today's video. Enjoy the game tomorrow night as well. We'll speak to you at full time.